Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. In the dwindling days of the Trump administration, President Trump is breaking all kinds of norms and records as he's done for the last four years. Beyond the wild and completely groundless claims of widespread voter fraud and his efforts to overturn a valid election, uh, he's also looking to break records as the president responsible for more federal executions uh, than any president in a century. And so we are revisiting the issue of the death penalty this week with an episode we recorded a while back that I thought was particularly relevant uh, today, this week, as we're hearing about uh, prisoners in, uh, on federal death row uh, being lined up for uh, one after another after another uh, execution. Um, and uh, if, if, if that's not disturbing enough, wait till you hear more about the leading way in which uh, executions are carried out in this country, which is lethal injection. Uh, supposed to be a more quote-unquote humane a way of ending life. But as you'll hear from our guest, Joel Zivat, uh, that's not the case. Uh, Dr. Zivat is an anesthesiologist and critical care physician on the staff at uh, Emory Law School and also on the School of Medicine at Emory in Atlanta. He has lectured and written extensively on lethal injection and the role physicians play in lethal injection. Uh, we talk about that generally. We also talk about a specific case to end it up in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, unfortunately, that case involving inmate Russell Bucklew ended in Mr. Bucklew being put to death. Uh, despite the objections, both legal, constitutional, and on the basis of medical ethics, as you'll hear. Uh, but a really important, informative, and unfortunately, very timely discussion about lethal injection and the death penalty. Uh, stay tuned for this episode. And by the way, as always, as we are still in the midst of this terrifying and dangerous surge in the coronavirus pandemic, everyone, please uh, wear masks and do everything that you can while our country waits for distribution of vaccines, something that's going to take at least a couple of months now. Please continue to be safe, you and your families, uh, and uh, enjoy this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. On this episode of Good Law, Bad Law, we're talking about the death penalty. Can a death row inmate be too sick to receive capital punishment? What are the medical ethics issues involved in administering lethal, lethal injection as a method of receiving the death penalty? What are the medical concerns surrounding the death penalty? To help us understand that is one of the country's leading experts and literally an expert witness in a case that will be argued before the Supreme Court in just a couple of weeks, my guest today, Dr. Joel Zivit. So Dr. Zivit, first of all, thank you so much for being on the program. Hi, thank you very much for having me. We, we are going to be talking about this case, the Bucklew case, which is uh, before the Supreme Court this term. Uh, a case that really calls into question many aspects of the way in which the death penalty is administered, and particularly uh, the method of uh, lethal injection. And uh, Dr. Zivit, you've, you are an expert witness in this case. Your testimony uh, not only is a, a central part of the issues the Supreme Court's going to face, but also I think really so important for us all to understand about where we are in this country when it comes to the death penalty 
and what some of the bigger moral, ethical, and and medical and scientific issues are uh, when it, when the uh, when we need to understand the death penalty. So very grateful to have you on to talk with me about these things. And but first of all, as we always do, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little background on yourself, I know you are a physician. Uh, if you just give us some background on your your medical background, what type of physician you are, and uh, and what you do when you're not involved in this type of case. Sure. Uh, thanks, Aaron. And please just call me Joel. That's that's fine. Super. Okay. I will. Thanks. So uh, I I'm a I have two medical specialties. Uh, the first is anesthesiology, and as an anesthesiologist, I I work in an operating room setting and and I provide anesthetics to patients who are undergoing uh, surgical procedures. And my second specialty is something called critical care medicine. Uh, that's a kind of a complementary specialty uh, with anesthesiology, and in that role. I work in intensive care units and care for, for individuals who find themselves there as a consequence of a serious and significant illness. And I've been practicing uh, both of those specialties for about 25 years now. So I've, I guess, seen a few things along the way. Right. Um, and you are also, you also teach, is that right? I do. Well, I, you know, I have a academic appointment and I teach, uh, um, a variety of individuals. Um, I teach uh, medical students and physicians who are in training. I also uh, teach uh, undergraduate students, and I have an occasional appointment and teach law students actually as well, uh, which is very fun for me. Uh, as a doctor, usually if I'm in a room full of lawyers, I feel rather nervous. <laughs> but uh, so I've had the good experience of collaborating with with uh, many excellent lawyers, and uh, so I also do teach law students as well on occasion. And what, what which law school is that that you're affiliated with? I, I'm affiliated with Emory University mm -hmm. in Atlanta. And let me just, of course, mention that these views that I'm expressing are mine, and I, I'm not speaking on behalf, of course, of Emory University or or the, the school in any in any capacity. Right. Okay. And. Since we're talking about the death penalty, we'll get into the facts of the Bucklew case and, and your involvement in it. But I know from from chatting with you a bit that you have been involved in one way or another in death penalty litigation through a number of cases over the years. Tell us tell us a little bit of your background on that and how, how you first became involved in uh, these cases, these capital cases. Sure. Well, let me say that uh, I... I didn't have much connection with capital punishment. I didn't think about it much. I, I live in Georgia. That's a state that does practice capital punishment. And so, of course, I was aware of capital punishment. Um, but I, I, I hadn't set my mind to it much. The way it began for me was uh, in an earlier version of the method of capital punishment that we now uh, refer to as lethal injection, a drug used to be used that was the first drug in lethal injection, and this drug was called sodium thiopental. Sodium thiopental is a drug in the barbiturate class. Mm -hmm. This is a drug that I used many times, perhaps thousands of times, to treat patients until one day the drug disappeared off the shelf and was no longer available. And this was a source of puzzlement and concern to me, and I wondered what happened to this drug and why it disappeared. And in my investigation of the disappearance of that drug, I learned that uh, the drug was, again, used in capital punishment. And it was a decision by the manufacturer at the time, Hospira, which was the pharmaceutical company that was making sodium thiopental, the last company to make it, mm -hmm. was making it at the time in Italy. And uh, in the European Union, where Italy is a member, there is a, a rule there that uh, no company can manufacture products that are used in capital punishment. Mm -hmm. And so the EU uh, issued a warning to Hospira. Hospira, by the way, is an American company, but they were manufacturing in Italy. And the company made a decision to stop making sodium thiopental because it didn't want to incur the risk of uh, a sanction. And so sodium thiopental disappeared from the world because of this. Mm -hmm. And it's, I... It's not to, but not to, but it's also fascinating to me too that your earliest uh, 
introduction into this world of uh, of capital punishment, cap death penalty cases, you you come at it from the standpoint as a physician who's familiar with a drug that is used to save lives, but come to see oh. it as a drug that is also used to take life. I, I think, Aaron, I think this is an excellent and central point that you make, and you'll see in this conversation that what I think is an issue here is is uh, the lexicon that is used uh, by people when they talk about these sorts of things. So, for example, when you, when we say sodium thiopental, of course, I think of that as a drug that's used, as you point out, to treat people and to help them get well. The state, of course, has another intention. They take that and they repurpose a drug, I think, and turn it into poison. But that's not how they describe it, of course. And they, and people think about these things and they, they say the word drug or even medicine. Mm -hmm. So no medicine or drug is invented by a pharmaceutical company with the purpose of killing. Aspira was not making sodium thiopental anticipating the lethal injection market. That was someone else's decision. Mm -hmm. And I think that the lethal injection broadly is designed intentionally to impersonate a medical act in every respect. And there, I think, is where a central problem lies. Right. And we're going to get into that. You're right, because, the, you know, in our intro, introduced this topic as one that involves medical ethics. And uh, one of the, as often happens in important uh, cases, in particular in important Supreme Court cases, is you'll have briefs and arguments made by the parties. In this case, there's a death row inmate on one side, and there's the state of Missouri on the other side, uh, where he uh, is on death row currently. But often there will be other uh, individuals or, or organizations who are interested in the outcome of the case and think they can contribute to the discussion and the arguments. And one of the entities that submitted a brief in this case, in the Bucklew case, is the American Medical Association, and uh, their discussion, which we, which, which we will get into, is all about the medical ethics of physicians and, and, and medicine and healing, what, what would ordinarily be used in healing of, of uh, human beings being used uh, as part of the process of, of, of deliberately taking life. So we will, we have to get into that. But anyway, go, go, go I want to have you go back to uh, uh, where, where you were before, which is helping us understand how you first got into uh, an awareness of this issue and then and became more deeply involved in it yourself. Yeah, so I, I um, based upon this, uh, this, um, finding of the disappearance of sodium thiopental, I set about to investigate again the explanation. And in my explanation, that led me to capital punishment. And after considering that for a while, I decided to write an opinion piece that I published, that was published in USA Today. This is a few years ago. And I wrote about how I, how I was concerned um, in the strongest way that lethal injection was now encroaching on the practice of medicine in a way that I found egregious. And I talked about it. You know, I w went, I guess, public on my, mm -hmm. my views on this. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult. You know, doctors uh, feel very wary about operating in, in the public space on some of these issues. I understand that's not the way that we're necessarily schooled. But I felt very strongly, and I wrote this piece, and that piece, you know, set up uh, a chain of events where I began to get contacted by people uh, about this case. And I, my opinion was sought then for a series of lethal injection cases that, um, that I guess sprung out from my initial opinion piece. And what, since that what, time, that, I... That opinion it, piece, though, what, I mean, what was the crux of, of, of your argument? What, you said that you were concerned about... Uh, capital punishment and the use of lethal injection encroaching on, on the practice of medicine, how? And what, what specifically was your concern there? So my, my concern was that, that execution does not need medicine, that there's nothing in the law that says that execution should be 
uh, only conducted in a particular way, in this case with lethal injection, a and the use of, of, again, my medications that the state has a different uh, intention for, and then even to the extent that these medications are no longer available. So what I said, and I, I appreciate um, that I used st strong, strong language, and I said that the method of execution needs to change that if the state, you know, it's the state's business to execute people, but it has to stay away from, from anything that is medical. And perhaps it's time to bring back, you know, the noose or the firing squad. Mm. Uh, and, and that that, it, I, two things, of course, I am in no way expert, but my point was that I felt the state was unreasonably encroaching dangerously encroaching on the practice of medicine here to the point that now I thought that that patients, individuals with no connection to this at all, could conceivably suffer as a consequence of an unavailability of, of medication uh, that would normal, normally be available for them. And that was the, I guess, the crux of my initial argument here. Well, my, and my, my mind is going in so many di different directions at one time right now, but uh, because this idea of suffering, uh, uh, of course, is, is crucial here because uh, we have an Eighth Amendment to the Constitution that forbids uh, any cruel and unusual punishment. We're talking about the ultimate punishment. We talk about the death penalty. And uh, so, so we're, we're, we're going to need to have, you know, very front and center in our thinking through of this problem, the idea that it is in our Constitution and the Bill of Rights uh, that that as a uh, as a government and as a society we value uh, that limitation on punishment very centrally. But you know, you brought a fire the firing squad, and I I did want to get in a little bit of facts and figures here too, so people understand because I think. I didn't really fully appreciate this until I uh, until I started doing my research, and I think people need to understand uh, that. Uh, and I'll just just rattle off a few sort of basic uh, pieces of information that I think are important here. That uh, we have 33 states in the country presently that uh, allow uh, the death penalty as a form of uh, punishment, for capital punishment. And that since the beginning of our country, uh, we've had state-run executions. Uh, for most of our country's history, uh, any prisoner who received the death penalty was executed by hanging uh, or by firing squad. You mentioned firing squad. Uh, and that that changed at the, at the latter part of the 1800s when the electric chair was invented. Uh, but it was really at the end of the 1900s uh, that lethal injection first was used as a form of execution and to the point where now uh, the vast majority of executions in this country are carried out uh, by the method of lethal injection. Um, in the first 10 years of, of this century, from uh, 2000 to 2009, there were Roughly 550 executions carried out in 27 states, 98.3% uh, of them by lethal injection. So this is the preferred and predominant method of execution uh, in our country with most of those, with, a, with a, a very sizable number of those executions taking place in the state of uh, Texas and Oklahoma uh, following behind in second place. So I just thought that background is important for people to understand the scope of this, uh, that this isn't just one case we're going to be talking about, the case of uh, Russell Bucklew, but this is something that perhaps outside of people's uh, consciousness on a day-to-day -day basis, we're very concerned about midterm elections and the latest tweet from our president and things like that. But so most people aren't thinking about capital punishment, but it is it is something that is uh, a fact of life um, in in our in our uh, system of uh, carrying out justice in this cr country. So, you know, with that background, when you start getting involved in this issue, by this point, um, lethal injection is it, and you're you're I, I imagine you're finding just how 
widespread is the use of lethal injection when it comes to administering the death penalty. Yes, and and I, I want to you know make a few things clear here too. Um, so let me start by saying that I am not an advocate for any particular kind of method of execution. And so in my piece, when I talked about, I think the firing squad or the gas chamber or hanging, I was meant. It was. I recognized that it was not that I was an advocate for a method, and that's something that I think frustrates medicine and people like me, where people ask me all the time, well, if, if, if this method isn't good, then name another method. And my position is, I am not. An, what you're asking me is, am I an expert in killing? Mm. And my answer is that as a physician, I'd like to think of myself as an expert in unkilling. Right. And I, I have no knowledge as to what method of execution would be better. I cannot opine. And I did not learn this in medical school or in my practice, how to measure this issue in this way. L let me also say that what's interesting about the method of execution, I will say that if you look in the last century, that I don't believe that any method of, ex any method of execution has ever actually been set aside per se, that there are methods of execution that no longer take place. And the reason why methods of execution have been set aside is not because of a court decision, but because of a public opinion about what is perceived to be something now that is regarded as cruel. And what does it mean to be cruel? I think that cruelty as a concept uh, evolves naturally with the maturation and progression of a civil society. Mm. And so where uh, the gas chamber or the firing squad or, or the guillotine or hanging, these methods of execution have come and gone. Now, the problem, of course, is from the court's perspective, cruelty is something that is, is of concern to the condemned. But they're actually the least qualified, in a way, if you will, to opine on whether or not their own death was cruel, clearly. Once dead, we can never ask them, and that execution doesn't uh, provide for some sort of ongoing cruelty machine that can be attached as someone dies. And so cruelty, in fact, has really been an experience of witnesses, that the witnesses here are critical to the experience of an execution. And the challenge, I think, too, is that lethal injection really creates a curated event of, of killing, of state killing, in terms of what can and cannot be seen, what can and cannot be measured. And, and further, that when one reads about or talks to people who witness an execution, uh, let me say I myself have witnessed an execution here in Georgia, mm -hmm. it's pretty hard to know what you're seeing because not much necessarily happens. And not much happens because of the nature of the way that the chemistry is working. But let's be clear that the interior experience of the person that is now dying is not accessible to the eye of the witness. And so you can be fooled and misled into thinking that what you're seeing is proceeding in a way that is not cruel. I will tell you that in my opinion, having reviewed lethal, many lethal injections, the cruelty is on the inside. It can't be seen by the witnesses. And so I think people have been misled into thinking that what they're seeing now is a peaceful sort of way to die. And to be clear, too, the court is not looking for peaceful and it's not looking for humane. It's really the standard is only not cruel. And I have said before that the absence of cruelty is not the presence of humaneness because people are very concerned about humaneness and execution. Those people that are advocates for capital punishment and feel that the inmate, having now been convicted and com having committed a terrible crime for which I am alive to, I recognize that there's real suffering here um, from survivors and so on, that, uh, that the inmate is owed no humaneness and that punishment should be as severe and retributive as possible. But the court, I think, rightly has tried to 
create some temperance through this um, concern about cruelty. But cruelty is, again, hard to measure. Well, and, and you're, you're speaking of such a fundamental question here, which is cruelty according to whom? Uh, you know, is, is, is the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment meant to protect the one who's being punished? If so, and I'm, this is, uh, you are quoted actually in the American Medical Association's uh, submission to the Supreme Court, uh, according to the, uh, to the brief that was filed, you're quoted as saying, the dead can never tell us if they experienced cruelty in their death. The responsibility to guard against cruelty is entirely in the hands of the observers. But you're, I think, raising as well a question about what, how we think about cruelty. I mean, the, the dead can't come back and tell us what they experienced in their final moments, of course. But there is an appreciation for what is cruel is measured by what people feel about what happened those who are actually in the room witnessing the execution, certainly, but also all of the rest of us, to the extent we become aware, we're conscious of what ta actually takes place. Um, you know, you, you, this is, uh, uh, you know, another point raised in this brief that if we were really concerned with avoiding cruelty to the one who is being executed, uh, and I know that you won't opine, you won't give us an opinion on which method truly is the most humane or the least cruel. But probably if we were looking for the swiftest method, the one that brings death about the most quickly, it probably would actually be the guillotine. Uh, and, and, and this is discussed in the brief. It's, it's death comes pretty quickly <laughs> When, the, when that blade falls compared to anything else. Uh, but there's a sense, there's a feeling about that being cruel uh, that, that probably is why the guillotine isn't used today. As you say, we have a sense of our, ourselves as a, as a mature and civilized people that wouldn't use that method. But what, you know, to what extent are we actually aware of the method that is used? And what do we think about, you know, we, isn't lethal, object, uh, lethal injection so pervasively used now because it's perceived, as you say, as, as a medical-like procedure and one that we can think of as a sanitary or sanitized form of execution because, it, after all, it's just medicine that's put into somebody's veins and then quietly they go. Hey, Aaron, I think, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I think that that again, that what I call an impersonation of medicine, is not an, mm -hmm. uh, not an accident. And I think that the irony here, of course, is that when the guillotine was put in place, that actually was felt at the time to be not cruel, to be less cruel than other methods of execution. So the guillotine was felt to be a progressive method of execution because of your to your point perhaps instantaneous decapitation, which resulted in some sort of instantaneous death. So, of course, now when we think about the guillotine, it, it seems horrifying to us. Right. Uh, and that we would never think that the guillotine would be a less cruel method than lethal injection. But these are like, this is the crux of the problem is how does one gauge cruelty? Um, what's involved in measuring cruelty? I don't think I think that what is employed generally with respect to witnesses is their capacity for empathy. But in truth, the way that witnesses, of course, are selected is that every witness there, of course, has an opinion as to what is happening before them. So witnesses for the state may be in favor of capital punishment. Witnesses for the inmate may be against it. Witnesses of the survivors have a different point of view. So all of these points of views impact the way that we measure what we are seeing with our eyes. And this is well understood in terms of the problems of eyewitnesses to other sorts of events. We, you know, our view on what we're seeing affects the way we, we gauge it, especially something like lethal injection, where not much seems to happen. 
So if not mm-hmm. much seems to happen, then it's possible to lay out all manner of opinion to you know to to determine or to, to gauge again what has been what has been witnessed. Well, and you know, I think this is uh, this is important to bring into the discussion before we get into some of the specifics of the case and what that specific case might tell us about this issue. But the, in the uh, in the submission to the Supreme Court by the petitioner by the the inmate, Mr. Bucklew, um, the uh, the lawyers representing uh, him in this case uh, point out. Speaking of the Eighth Amendment, that uh, the wisdom is this is uh, on page eight of their submission. We'll we'll post a link to to all of these submissions if people want to read these. The wisdom of the Eighth Amendment is that it recognizes the temptation to be indifferent to the needless suffering of those society condemns and demands we resist it. A society that tolerates stripping any man of his irreducible dignity even one who merits the ultimate punishment, takes a fateful step. This court, referring to the Supreme Court, is uniquely positioned to defend this sacred value, and it should do so in this case. So there's, uh, again, a sense here that what we're really talking about is what cruelty means in punishment, in the most extreme form of punishment, and what we're... uh, allowing ourselves to resist when we think about lethal injection as the way in which death is administered. And I think that's, you know, when you talk about the observers, I mean, we ultimately we are all observers to, to an execution, even if we're not actually in the room where it takes place. I think that executions are meant to be public events. And this may be an affrontery to people because they might believe that it would be indecent to witness an execution. I guess I will say as an aside, I would not want to live in a country that executes people in secret and that execution is meant to be observed. And the observation here is, again, is not meant for some uh, degraded participation it's really meant to be a guard against cruelty. It has always been such. That is the guard. Uh, that's always been the case. And I, I, it's disturbing to me that the states, some states that practice execution have made the witnessing of execution increasingly difficult. Or again, as I've say, stated before, as a curated event where you can't really see it. And so you don't really know. Or you've seen something and then you think, well, that looked... Okay, I guess, and and I I think these things need to be exposed, and in order to have a proper public debate on what we think about capital punishment, let's shine some light on what's happening here, and then we're in a better position to decide. Right. Because I think that presently, it's obscured from our view in many ways. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, I wonder what would happen to the death penalty in this country if if executions were televised. I mean, you're right. They always have been public to some extent. What what would be the difference between having it witnessed by the the individuals who are physically present and physically present and actually being something everyone could see? I, I'm not trying to create a ghoulish sort of uh, situation, but I do think it's important to. In order to fully bring to bear one's empathy, which again is necessary to gauge cruelty, it's important to really understand what is at play, what is really happening, what this death really looks like. And that's why I actually think that lethal injection has honestly been regressive, because what it has done is that it it has blocked our capacity to engage our empathy, to be able to measure whether what we see before us is cruel or not. It's it's almost like the use of lethal injection has anesthetized us to uh, or desensitized us to what execution really is, uh, what's involved to to the uh, to the prisoner, to the one receiving the punishment, what how we all experience it, what we think about it. 
what's actually going on, what it means as a society. Um, we're all we're all in effect being desensitized to this. I I, I agree with you, Aaron. I agree with you. It's a it's a problem. All right. So so let's talk about let's talk about this specific case because. Uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty extreme case in a lot of ways uh, for for a death penalty. I mean, death penalty, of course, should involve the most serious crimes committed, and this this certainly is no exception. Uh, and and it's important to note uh, that uh, Russell Bucklew, who uh, was convicted 22 years ago for a pretty uh, a pretty hideous uh, uh, crime spree. And fought, he he murdered a man. He he raped a, a woman who had been his girlfriend. Um, he shot at a little kid. He engaged the police in a chase that resulted in uh, a lot of risk and injuries to police officers. I mean, he 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 did some very very bad things. There's no doubt about it. And importantly, it's my understanding he's not challenging. His conviction. He's not. He's he's uh, accepting that he is to receive the ultimate uh, uh, punishment, uh, but he's asking the court in this case that he not receive lethal injection. And and uh, although we noted this earlier, the the pervasive use of lethal injection, uh, it, it is I think important for people to know that. And I think you alluded to this earlier. There are other methods currently available and allowed under varying state law in Missouri, for example, where where this execution uh, may ultimately take place. Uh, lethal gas is an alternative to a lethal injection. And in the last uh, number of years, there I was surprised to see there actually has been one execution by firing squad and still a handful uh, of executions carried out by electrocution, by um, uh, by that method as well. So uh, Buck, uh, Bucklew is not saying, uh, let me appeal and, and try to avoid this punishment. He's saying, I can't and shouldn't be subjected to lethal objection. I think I keep saying lethal objection, I mean lethal injection. Uh, but but Joel, as a, as a physician, you need to explain why this is so relevant in his particular case and, and may be relevant in all cases, but it's particularly pointed in his case for some special medical reasons I think you need to explain a little bit. Yes, sure. Well, let's, let's um, by way of background, let me raise a couple of uh, things that need to be understood. The first thing is that uh, inmates, after Estelle versus Gamble, inmates have been, are now, constitutionally required to receive health care. So interestingly, you know, inmates are perhaps the only citizens of this country that their health care rights are constitutionally protected. And you're talking and about a health- Supreme Court case that, that, that yes. made that decision. Sure. It was Estelle versus Gamble. And I, I think that what's interesting and, and further that that health care has to be real. So mm-hmm. it can't be pretend. And when you're an inmate, even getting obtaining you know one tablet of Tylenol can be a complicated sort of endeavor. So the healthcare has to be real; it has to be available, and it raises a lot of other kinds of complex problems. The other thing is that prolonged incarceration is hard on people's health, and as you point out, you know Russell Bucklew has been on the row for uh, 20, 22 years waiting to be executed, right. and as a, as a consequence of his prolonged uh, incarceration. He has, I suppose, as as his others, has developed coexisting medical problems. And in his case, he has a very unusual medical problem. He has something called a cavernous hemangioma. Cavernous hemangiomas are are tumors that are consistent that consist of of a uh, kind of a plexus of blood vessels that form into a into a a collection. And the blood vessel tumors grow and expand in the body. And in his case, these are actually in his throat and in his face. And so these tumors now have grown. And they are uh, altering the normal anatomy of his throat and his airway. And so when one talks to Russell Bucklew, he has 
a voice quality that sounds to my ear to be someone, again, who has uh, a narrowing of the aperture of their airway. Mm-hmm. And there's a consequence of, and let me also point out too, that these uh, tumors are not simply removable, that they can't be resected, cut away, mm-hmm. and, and uh, they will grow slowly, but they grow. And in Russell's case, over the years, the tumors have grown to a point where his airway now is compromised, which in in him, that means that when he lies flat, he finds it difficult to breathe. He can choke. And in choking, uh, these tumors, when he chokes, the tumors are uh, further engorged with blood and they can rupture and bleed. And so the bleeding that occurs then in the airway can make him choke further and he can, you know, conceivably choke to death. These tumors could rupture and that and he would die as a consequence of, of strangulation by his own, these tumors. And the, nat- the nature of it is that these tumors, they're, they're pretty sensitive, right? It's not, um, they're, they're very susceptible to, to rupturing. And so bleeding is fairly common, as I read in the papers yes. for the case. Sometimes he wakes up and he's got blood on his face because one of these tumors ruptured or he might have blood in his his mouth or in his throat from one of these uh, rupturing, depending on how he slept or how he ate or or things like that. And and it's not that he's not incapable of lying flat. He, Mm -hmm. He can, but he has to focus all of his attention to breathing very carefully in a very specific sort of way. And it's very uncomfortable for him. It's not the way that he normally chooses to sleep. And and so he has to mindfully apply himself to maintaining his airway patency in the circumstance of when his airway is perpetually compromised. And and so I was asked to see, you know, Russell a few years ago now Mm -hmm. about this problem. And I recognize that in the way that I understood the state's method of execution at the time, that I was concerned that that in so doing that these tumors were at a very high risk of rupturing and choking, and that the kind of death, in my opinion at the time, that he would experience would be cruel beyond, again, what the Eighth Amendment prescribes. And, and, and again, Russell has, as an inmate, a right to health care. And how on the, I further you know, uh, have considered the problem of how can one... Um, have their right to health care take place while they're being executed? And does the health care right is set aside? And and if so, for how long? And if the execution fails, is the right to health care restored? You can't kill people by giving them a series of sublethal injuries that over time would result in death. So I can't so, go so, like that. Let me let me understand that so far, because because I think there are some very particular reasons in this inmate's case why lethal injection poses some problems and question whether lethal injection to this individual would constitute more so than others. Uh, cruel and unusual punishment. But I think you're making, before we get to that point, an even broader point, which is given that the Supreme Court has already ruled that inmates are enti- have a constitutional right to health care, uh, does, does that fundamentally clash with the death penalty where you are, in effect, acting in the complete opposite interest from uh, g- giving giving somebody health care, you're, you're taking away health care, you're, you're, you're executing that individual. So you're, you're, I think, pointing to a fundamental contradiction in the way our law has evolved in terms of uh, how we treat death row prisoners. Is it, am I understanding that correctly? I, I think that's right. And as a case in point, consider the execution of Clayton Locke at who was executed a few years ago in Oklahoma. This is an execution I think was widely reported because of the difficulties that ensued with establishing uh, intravenous access. But Mm -hmm. in Mr. Lockett's case, what's noteworthy is that on the day of his execution, he did not want to come out of his cell. And so he was tasered in order to remove him. 
And in the ensuing um, uh, you know, struggle to get him out of the, his cell, it was observed that he had sustained a laceration on his arm. And there, it's a report that this laceration was evaluated, and a statement was made something to the effect of that the laceration did not need to be sutured. That was the opinion. Mm -hmm. And so one might find that incredible that just before executing someone, someone would look at a laceration and first stitch and repair a laceration where moments later the person would be dead. And why would that take place? And right. I think that that's an acknowledgement of the state's obligation to provide health care at least all the way up until and perhaps during an execution. And if an execution method uh, conflicts or creates an unusual situation because of coexisting health care, there I think lies the central problem. And with Russell, my view is that Russell will die more likely of choking. That will be his method of death. He'll choke to death on his own blood. And, and that because of these tumors, because of the way that lethal injection is configured, that would be his cause of death. In other words, In that before, regard, before the so-called medicines are able to uh, take their effect on him and, and take his life, before, because that's a process that takes some amount of time. Uh, before those before those effects can can uh, have their ultimate re result, you're saying he's going to experience complications from his medical condition that necessarily he won't receive treatment for because he's in the process of being executed, and that he will and, die. Right? Yes, that's it exactly. That I think that he'll be aware that he's choking to death before mm -hmm. he dies, and that I think exceeds. I would say unambiguously. Uh, the cruelty standard. And so in that way, that isn't going to work. So, and, and related to that, uh, you know, I ask you this as a physician, and, and again, this is, an, uh, this is a, a point that's explored in the American Medical Association submission. I mean, you're pointing to this conflict between the obligation to not withhold medical treatment just because somebody is incarcerated uh, on the one hand, and administering what looks like medical treatment to execute somebody, there being an inherent conflict. But also, isn't it necessary when we talk about lethal injection that that be administered by a healthcare professional? In fact, although they're not named by name, uh, there is an anesthesiologist like yourself who must be part of the administering of these lethal drugs. And the Hippocratic Oath speaks to the question of a physician's ethical, moral responsibility in terms of, uh, you know, what your responsibilities are to, uh, uh, to not do harm to, to someone under your care. So how does, that, how does that idea play into what we're talking about here? Well, so much there of what you said, Aaron. <laughs> so let's, let's see if I can. So let me start by saying that I would say that death is not a treatment. And that if death was a treatment, we would be, you know, perhaps using it uh, much more broadly. Some probably would use it more broadly. There's a choice between either curing you or killing you. Perhaps people would say, well, let's just kill you instead. Now, I don't think the public thinks that that's a very good idea from their doctor. The second thing is, is that secrecy laws in, in place in certain states make investigating who actually is doing what difficult. States pass secrecy laws that obscure the identity of individuals and what their roles, roles are. Um, they take the position that uh, you know, uh, lethal injection is, is permissible, and so the state should be able to do whatever it needs to protect the individuals that practice it. Um, the medical profession is, you know, supposed to stand apart. And uh, although the, you know, the state medical boards, of course, are created by legislative acts, and the medical board cannot supersede, I guess, the will of the legislature. 
But what it creates is this strange situation where the governor becomes the chief physician of a state. The governor then can begin to direct the way that medicine might be carried out. And of course, I would strongly object to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also that with respect to whether a doctor has a role here, let me just talk for a moment about the doctor-patient relationship and what that means practically. So if I have a, a, a patient, a person rather, before me, and we meet in a professional capacity, that individual is not necessarily yet my patient. So we have a conversation, and we, uh, if we agree that that's going to be what we're going to do, we engage in a, a social, in a, in a contract, uh, and the contract uh, that we engage in is the doctor-patient relationship. And right. in that contract, of course, I'm allowed to do things to that individual. I'm allowed to touch them, uh, you know, examine them, uh, give them medication, all sorts of things. They're my patient. But an inmate is not my patient. Mm. So that inmate did not choose me. And even though I'm standing there as a doctor in a lab coat, that does not de facto make an inmate my patient. And Mm -hmm. so I would begin to say, by what right does the physician even have a role here at all? So is the physician saying, well, look, I am a physician, I'm trained as a physician, but here I'm not really acting as a physician. I'm just acting as a person that knows these sorts of things. And so, yes, I'm doing technical things that physicians do, but I'm not actually a physician. But can, I think but can, a, a, physician, of... can a physician ethically lay hands on a patient or an individual, so to speak, without that patient's agreement? Well, I think that there are circumstances where where, say, for example, let's say that a person is injured in an accident and they're, and they're unconscious as a consequence of their, their injury. Yeah. Now they're brought to an emergency department. And they can't give now, consent in that case. They can't give consent, but there is an assumption of consent based upon the relationship. That's understood. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's, that's clear. Now, later on, if a person regains consciousness and regains agency, they may at that point say, I do not want to be treated. And in that case, I would, I would have to stop. But here an inmate is not ever, that's, I don't see the, that there's an assumption that can be made that an inmate wants a doctor in this regard. Because again, the doctor here is not there to treat. You know, if, if, a, if a physician believes that there is a role there, I would say that the role would be the opposite. They would try to, you know, it, it's been stated by others, uh, by other physicians, that that one way to think about this is that now execution is a lethal disease. Uh, and so now my role here as a physician is to treat of the lethal disease, which is execution. Mm-hmm. I, again, think that that's an absurd argument because I would take the opposite position, that if there's a lethal disease here, my job would be to cure it, not to prevent it, not to enable it. So I, I think that physicians just because they're standing in the execution chamber or or have no physician-patient right, that there is no contract there. I I will add that I actually can conceive of a circumstance where a physician might actually be engaged. And that would be, for example, if the execution should fail. So if the execution fails or the inmate is not killed, not in the way that the execution is supposed to kill them, Suddenly, the inmate now is an injured individual with a right to health care. And I would go so far as to say that now a physician should step in and resuscitate yeah. the injured inmate. And that's the role. Now there's a doctor-patient relationship that, that, that I see could take place. Well, I don't, and I don't want to get too far down this side alley that I'm about to point out here, but there are some states now that allow physician-assisted suicide. And yes. again, I know that's that's maybe wildly off topic, but... No, I think people bring that up too, but let's just be yeah. clear that in that circumstance, first of all, the the individual there is choosing it, I suppose. You could argue yeah. that an individual says, I want to die. I need you to help me. Now, I have my own views about physician-assisted suicide, but mm. uh, I, at least the difference there I see is that uh, one would hope that an individual with agency makes that choice. Right. Now, and I think the I states that you, allow that are, are have very, very particular and, and, and rigorous regulations to make sure that 
the patient does actually express that agency and is able to and, and is able to uh, uh, you know form the form a consent and a, and so it's very very regulated in that regard that's very different yeah I mean we don't usually use inmates for for as as subjects in experiments anymore because we recognize you know the terrible conflict and the terrible strain on agency and so inmates cannot you know volunteer like the whole relationship between an, a patient and an indi- and a physician is based upon this you know the principle that an, an individual is at liberty and so if an individual is at liberty then they have a certain kind of way that they see the world in terms of what it is that they want me to do but an inmate who is not at liberty you know has a much harder way of expressing their position uh, and even arguably that they would want to get well like if an inmate can be quote cured of a condition so they can then be executed is that something that an individual might seek uh, how, how, that doesn't seem to follow as an assumption that uh, where an in, inmate may choose to stay ill uh, if it means that they would not be executed mm-hmm. uh, again i'm not judging it one way or the other i'm just explaining how complicated it is to create these sorts of relationship a doctor quote, patient relationship with an, with an incarcerated individual not at liberty, facing their own death. All right. So, so, so in, in this individual's case, we, we, as you point out, there is this very broad fundamental conflict uh, between the requirement to give medical care and in, in a case of execution, the, the ultimate withdrawing of care. Um, but in his particular case, because of his medical condition, he's also making an argument that, because again, he's not challenging the ultimate sentence. He's just saying, give me gas. Don't give me a lethal injection. And why, why is, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that argument here? Well, so the, the, the problem is that according to Glossop, that in order for an as applied challenge here to prevail, which is what Bucklew is making, is that Glossop not only requires him to say that the particular method of execution is cruel, but that he has to name an alternative. And Glossop, and again, is naming, another, that's another Supreme that, Court case, Glossop. Yes, correct. Ahead, yeah, okay. Glossop versus Gross. Go ahead, that, okay. That, yeah. So in Glossop, uh, that was decided in Glossop that an inmate has to name another method in order. So it has two things. It has to prove that the method is, is itself creates cruelty, and second, that the inmate can name another method. Mm -hmm. And so what happened, you know, where I was involved, of course, is that I said that this method of execution is cruel for these reasons. But I am, I have no way of ethically describing another method of execution that is less cruel. That I, it's beyond what I, I can do what I'm willing to do ethically, I have no, because now what you're asking me to do is design a method of killing, which I, I cannot. Or endorse uh, I will not. I cannot and will, and I will not endorse or describe mm-hmm. method of execution. And so for, in, in the case of Glossop, the, you know, the court decided, well, that Glossop didn't meet his burden, that he didn't name a second method of execution, and therefore he loses. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, and so what the AMA you know, does in their brief here is they support my position that you can't ask a doctor to endorse a method of execution. And you can only, a doctor can only say that, you know, what they see before them is, will cause death in this way. And, and so I'm in no position and I will not be in a position to name an alternative method. And if and the it, law requires me to do so, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't. And I haven't, I haven't really seen in the papers that I read through a reason why the state of Missouri won't uh, use gas other than because they do allow that under state law as an alternative, but they apparently don't have any uh, protocol spelled out for how they would carry that out. I guess that's because they just, even though they're authorized to use gas, they just don't use it. They use lethal induct, injection and they have a spe- specific protocol for how to carry it out and who's involved and all that. So they, I guess they are sticking with lethal injection as their preferred method because as a practical matter, it is their own. 
Yeah, I, I, I can't I can't know. I mean, what what's going on in their mind there? I mean, certain states actually have no other method. And so if an inmate brings an as applied challenge in some of these other states where there is no actual other method, how would they create the sort of you know, defense that would satisfy Glossop? There is no other method. We had a little bit of technical problems there at the end of my conversation with Dr. Zivit. We, uh, in that last minute or so of our conversation, we simply wrapped up, talked about this great argument that's coming on November 6th in the Supreme Court on this case, and that we're all going to be looking very closely to see how the Supreme Court handles this case. I want to thank Dr. Zivit very much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. What a fascinating, incredible, uh, far-ranging conversation on moral and ethical issues on the death penalty. Uh, really opened my mind and stretched my thinking, and I think uh, all of you, I hope, will also find it to be an engaging conversation. As always, uh, I appreciate feedback, so don't hesitate to send us a comment, uh, an email. You can go to the website, www.law-podcast.com, and you can leave feedback there as well. Thanks for listening to this, this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. Talk to you soon.